so I think we should we can start. Um, so welcome everyone to our literary encounter. Thank you all for being here tonight. This event is part of the French Spring Festival 2021. And since the theme is the island, we wanted it to be an invitation to think about the different aspects of insularity through a literary lens from a French and Sri Lankan perspective. Uh, for this, we're honored to have with us tonight internationally renowned authors Olivier Weber and Ashok Ferret. Uh, we'll start with a discussion of around 45 minutes on this topic and then open to questions of, to the audience. So you're free to write in the chat box any questions you may have. I also wanted to warn you that this discussion is being recorded and being uh, broadcasted live on our Facebook page and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in case uh, you want to rewatch it. <laughs> So Olivier Weber is a French writer and journalist. He has received several awards for his literary work, including the Albert Londres Prize and the Joseph Kettel Prize, of which he is president today. Uh, he's been a war correspondent during 20 years for major international titles, including The Guardian, Le Point and Libération. He has covered various conflicts around the world, including in Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Kurdistan, and South Sudan. He is also engaged in humanitarian action, uh, from 2008 until 2013, he has been appointed French ambassador in charge of human trafficking and human rights. As a filmmaker, he has directed several documentaries, including Gold Fever and The Opium of Talibans, which received international and national awards. His work Frontière invokes uh, travel during two years on complicated and forbidden borders from Pakistan to Amazonia. His books have been translated into a dozen languages, and his latest book, Au Royaume de la Lumière, transports us to the small kingdom of Mustang nested within the Himalayan mountains. And best-selling Sri Lankan author Ashok Ferre, uh, if I still have to introduce him here, <laughs> uh, has read uh, pure <laughs> mathematics at Oxford University, subsequently forging a career as a builder in London before becoming a writer. Uh, author of seven books, his first two books of short stories, Call Petit People and The Good Little Silonese Girl, were both shortlisted for Sri Lanka's Russian Award. His third book, Serendipity, Part Satire, Part Thriller, was shortlisted for Sri Lanka State Literary Award, and the Ceaseless Chatter of Demons was nominated for the 2015 Grecian Prize. The satirical tale, which from France, Eastern tradition and European modernity, is his first novel translated into French, uh, published by Mercure de France. The Unmergeable Man is his latest novel, and was published in 2021 by Penguin India. So now we will leave the floor to our two invited guests with this opening question. Do you believe there is a myth of insularity in literature? Okay. Olivier, over to you. Start <laughs> as you want. Okay, so good afternoon and hello to everybody. Thanks for the French Embassy and all the, all the organizers for this very interesting festival. And even at distance, it's very good actually to exchange with you and with Ashok. I'm very happy to see you. I hope to see you again but in physical presence at that distance. So coming back to your question, yeah, I think there's a, there's a myth, but uh, it's coming also from two sides actually. It's coming about insecurity, a coercive one not chosen and celebrity, then a voluntary one from the uh, writer, but also from, from the artist actually, and in literature, the theme of uh, insularity is uh, very common actually, because it's producing a new concept, a new trend, new frames actually of literature. I just remember, for me, it was a novel, so I wrote a few years ago, called The Barbares, actually kind of pirates, the pirate in French, uh, Le Barbaresque in French. So it's about the famous writer from Spain, Cervantes, who used to write uh, El Quixote, which is uh, Don Quixote in, in English. And it was published in the beginning of 17th century. And so Cervantes have been sized uh, when he was traveling at sea in the Mediterranean Sea by the pirates. And he was 27 years old. It was at the end of the 16th century. And he was put in jail in Algeria, but it kind of open sky jail, very not luxurious, but I think with uh, good aspects. And uh, so he was thinking about how he can escape in his mind. And he produced one of the best novels at this time, maybe the best one we invented actually, the new 
literature is a novel, coming back from the medieval literature in medieval ages, middle age, and coming to modernity. And so just an example of how isolation, insularity can produce some new trends of uh, culture and uh, literary, uh, literary culture. So I think yeah, it's very important to see this development in the art and how actually a writer can fuel actually the psyche of a people, of a culture, of a tribe, of a village, etc., with the production of a literature and novel and fiction. But I think we'll speak later with Ashok on that uh, topic. It's how we can invent reality. Does a writer has to be based only on facts or only on imagination? What is the difference? What is the border actually? But maybe it will be the next question. So yes, insularity is a real myth but a good one, actually. It's fueling uh, new trends in literature, but not only literature, also in different parts of arts and culture. Yes, I'm, I'm not sure it is all to the good. And, and it's, a, it's a very, very topical subject right at the moment where everybody is being completely insular. But coming from an island myself, um, it's, it's a strange thing. I find that I think to many outsiders coming to say the island of Sri Lanka, we can be anything you want us to be. So it is a place that many people come, uh, particularly from France, where we had the, the, the supposed Comte de Monet who was here. But I mean, people come here to, to, to live out their fantasies. So, so in that sense, I, I feel this I, the idea, as you said, of, of, of insularity and an island culture is, is almost it is a myth in the sense that because it can then be it can mean so many things to so many different people actually it's a very very complex structure that we have here but but the idea of paradise island gives us this this image this hollywood image in our minds of rolling beaches and palm trees and the reality as as eric will certainly tell us is, is quite different it's it's you know it's a question of power cuts or disease or whatever, whatever. That is not to take away from the beauty of, of, of islands or whatever, but but it, it is a myth somewhat, I, I feel, I feel. I mean, Olivia, you've been all over the world. I mean, I, I'm ashamed when I see the list of countries you, you've been in. Um, and you, you have, I'm sure, been to many, many islands in your time, have you? Yeah, that's, that's true, that's true, actually. But uh, always going back at home <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's interesting because you have different aspects of insularity. So there's a real one, geographical one, political one like Sri Lanka, and your borders are first maritime. So you have to cross the border, you have to cross the sea to think over something else. And it's very interesting actually to go up and forth, go going and, and going back. Uh, what is your culture at home? And I think that's true aspect, two themes that are very, very important, especially now with confinement, especially with COVID, especially with lockdown, you mentioned Ashok. So it's dream and hope. Uh, we need to hope and we need all from young people to less, uh, <laughs> to older people actually, we need hope and we need dreams and we have to push back the board of dreams. Once you succeed, when you realize one dream, it could be in your physical life, in your mythical life, in your spiritual life, you have to fuel, you have to invent new one and to, 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 to push the border actually, to push the, the line of the mountains. If you are a mountaineer, you hike in the mountains, in, in Himalaya, in the French Alp, or in the mountains uh, not far from Kandy, uh, in the center of Sri Lanka, uh, you can cross, uh, you can um, hike, you can jump on the summit, and you have to invent after a new line, a new trek, uh, a, new, a new road. And it's very interesting to see and, and the art, the literary culture, I mean, the literature in general can, can help to, to have both uh, the hope and the dream, the dream and the hope. So, and coming back to your question, yes, I've been to many islands and it's very interesting to see uh, their cultures and um, actually there's two ways uh, to cross or to push back in serenity is to live with insularity or to invent new borders, to invent a new myth, actually, even a myth can be uh, very, very interesting to see. And uh, so, um, yeah, 
It's the same actually in some remote areas, even in France. I mentioned that uh, now I'm in the south of France and behind me there's the, the Alps, the famous mountains, and not far, it could be one hour, one and a half driving. My family is living there. And uh, it's a very remote area. So it's, it's called it's back country, actually. And it was the title of my last novel, L'arrière pays, in French. It means back country. And people are living very differently from here in the Côte d'Azur in Cannes, where there's a Cannes Film Festival, Nice and Monte Carlo. But actually, the two sides of the area need each other, the coast, the Côte d'Azur, so, and the mountains, the back country. And it's very interesting to see that people in the remote areas, in the mountain, uh, are inventing a new way of life, new way of culture, new way of exchanges, you know, and even if they are not traveling, even if you are staying at home, you know, this is part of the culture. So to, to invent and to try to have imagination to cross the borders, which, are, which actually are physical borders, you know, it's not sea, but they are mountains. And it's very interesting to see the drastic difference, but at the same time, some main topics on common sense, you know, to, to live together. So I think it's based for me on two, on these two ideas, uh, hope, hope and dreams. Uh, do you think this idea of insularity, uh, this creeping insularity, shall we call it, uh, it, particularly in the last 10, 15 years, I mean, do, do you think, I think it was there from before COVID and COVID has just given it a push right to the front, front of stage. Why, why do you think that is? Why, why is it that people are suddenly finding comfort or inspiration within their own societies rather than looking outward? When I think of the 70s, particularly, or the 60s, where everything was looking out and never in, and then now we have this idea that we know best. Now, now don't get me wrong, in Sri Lanka, we know best, absolutely. You know, nobody can tell us anything because we are an island and we've had 2,500 years of, of, of excellence. So yeah. that's it, benchmark. Yeah. But, but why, why is it that now places like America are becoming very insular, you know, yeah. and so on? What, why is that coming from Europe, coming from that Western world? Why, why do you think this is so? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I will ask you also the question later. But uh, I think to my sense, you know, uh, that's quite a kind of paradox, you know, with COVID. So uh, we used to renew with all roots. We are nomads. We are coming back from antique ages. And uh, we used to have legs to jump, to walk, to run, etc. And with the modern civilization, we used to sit and to walk at home and uh, to drive by car, especially in the Western world, but also in Sri Lanka and elsewhere in India and around. And so this is a new way of life. That's, that's kind of a dream also, but not always positive, but OK. They have some physical constraint. And there is a kind of nostalgia of that, you know, coming back to the nomadic age and coming back to travel. So. But at the same time, we are learning with COVID that first we, are, we feel some kind of anxiety to stay at home alone. We are not prepared for that, uh, even in terms of uh, culture, in terms of exchange, in terms of, I'm not meaning of isolation because we can stay at home and open the door and discuss in the streets and, uh, and exchange also with different means. But it's a fear to be alone and the fear to, yes, to have a vacuum. And uh, at the same time, there's a discovery that uh, to travel could be dangerous for the planet. I, I, even for me, I used to travel sometimes for one, one hour of conference to Morocco or to South America. And I will, do not, I will not do it again. You know, it's finished because uh, in terms of, you know, uh, climate change, it's right. I think uh, you have to know. Uh, to know about that, but after to, to for traveling uh, one month, two months, that's very different. And we have to travel with uh, the hurt, with open eyes. You know, sometimes we are not used to 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 meet local people and Western tourists and travelers. Used sometimes to stay in you know, some villages and I mean isolated from the local population. And we have to. Renew that, you know, it's very important. I, I, I'm sure you know that because you are living in an island which is not closed, which is an open island with history, with exchange, with commerce, with all the old maritime routes, etc. What do you think yourself about the post COVID and the post lockdown Ashraf? Do you think that uh, we also are afraid of the new way of life or that we can uh, struggle with well, it? Well, I am very afraid because what has happened is um, this has played into our own private perceptions 
uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think when I first started writing, I was not a writer. I wasn't. I only started writing at the age of 42. So it, it was quite a new thing for me. And I realized that that among Sri Lankan writers, we almost have our own language. Now that's putting it very fancifully, but I'll give you an example. There are certain words in English that the English don't use anymore, but we still use them. Um, the word dicky, you wouldn't understand what the word dicky was, but because it existed in the 1930s, it's the boot of a car. But here in Sri Lanka, when you write in English, if I said, put it in the boot of the car, people wouldn't understand. They would say, put it in the dicky. So, so we almost have our own island language, which of course the British bequeathed us, but it's from the 1930s, it's not, it's not from today. But what I'm trying to say is that, that we have this, uh, this terminology, this narrative, this language, and I don't mean just English, I mean this language of signs and behaviors and likes and dislikes. Uh, which COVID is only emphasizing. And, and I worry, I worry that I, it, it's very useful having this for, for our rulers, because in a way it's, it's very, very easy to, to have a homogeneous construct of Sri Lanka as this monolithic 2,500 year old structure. But, but I don't feel that that is actually correct. It's a very multi-layered complex country, as you know, because you have been here. But, but I fear that that is getting lost and, and COVID has only closed the boundaries up. So my real fear is that they will never open up again once COVID goes, because I, I, the mathematics of it tells me that it will be gone by September, October, or it will be pretty much gone. The fat lady won't have sung, but it will be gone. But I'm worried that the boundaries, the container will remain. I don't know, is this, am I being too fearful? I don't know. Is it... Uh, you are lucky because you are in France where perhaps things are more open or people are more vocal in their desire for openness. But on an island where, you know, it, it, it's more of a worrying scenario. Um, I'll never forget when I first went to England, I'm mean, at the age of 11 and it was another island, of course, but then going from there to the continent, I couldn't get over the fact that you could just drive through France and into Spain and you could have a nap almost, and then you woke up and you were somewhere else in another country, another language, another everything. Whereas here, you have to get on a plane to go. It's, it's quite a different ball game. So that sense of isolation is there anyway. You know, it's isola yeah. isolation, you know? It's very um, interesting. It's know. Sri Lanka. Yeah, it's very interesting. Sri Lanka is a kind of myth also in literature with uh, different uh, writers, but also in terms of travel, because I, I know this is a pearl, this is a fantastic island. Sir. But uh, I think also we are living in a strange world because it's true, we are living under the globalization. There's a globalization in terms of economy, of politics, of exchange, etc., of a modern also way of tools of communication, but uh, it's not a world village. That's not true. For, mm. let's say, just 30 years, 19, in 1991, there was the uh, fall of, of former USSR, you know. And since 30 years, the world produced more than 30,000 kilometers of boundaries, you know, in Central Asia, elsewhere, borders, walls. Uh, boundaries, uh, borders, in, in, even in, 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 inside the same state, Bangladesh around this circle, you know, with a, uh, a new border, a physical border from created by India. So we are not in a world village. We are living inside new boundaries and we have to live with that. We have to learn also what is a boundary. I think for me, border is not a, a negative point, actually. It's uh, sometimes the borders are unfair because it has been drawn by, uh, you know, the uh, colonial powers, like for example, in Africa in 1984-85 during the Congress of Berlin by colonial empires, uh, uh, British empire, the French empire, the, even the, the German empire. But the African states and head of states, when Africa has been uh, freed actually from, um, from colonization, let's say around the 60s, there was a new, the first round of um, meeting of new head of states in Cairo, in Egypt in 1964. And they say, okay, we win. We win against the colonial powers, but we'll keep the borders. It's the terms of international law, the borders coming from 
decolonization. We don't have to touch. If we touch ab about the border than the, let's say, Berlin Conference, it will be a disaster. And it has been a disaster in two countries, Eritrea on East Africa and South Sudan with civil war because the borders have been touched. So what I want to mean is that the border is not negative. The insecurity is not negative. And to have border is to recognize the over, to recognize alterity, to, and you don't have, we don't have in the world natural borders. All the borders have been negotiated by war, by treaties, by change, you know. And it's a time, it's a question also to a recognition. And it's very important. But when you have a country A, country B, and you have border in the middle, it's like to have an entity C, a third country, let's say, with different rules, with different aspects, different rule of commerce or sort of exchanges, etc. And the borders have to be um, are created to be open, you know, they are not hermetic, they are not real closed. And I think, but maybe I thought you will correct me if you are not agree, I think it's the same for insularity. So it's true, you have, you need to take a plane to go abroad, you have maritime borders. At the same time, you have imagination, you have also the, uh, uh, let's say, the strength of history for you. And I say that because now for two years, I've seen especially with the young people here in France, in Germany, in, in UK, in Spain, in Italy, people, uh, countries I used to travel, I speak the languages, to see the young people are afraid uh, to travel. And they say, maybe uh, now we just have to need to, we just need to hike in the mountain, not far from home, and uh, uh, maybe to live uh, far from the cities, if it's possible, and to grow potatoes and so on, the mountains. It's very interesting to see that for the young generation. And uh, it means also you have to work with different cultures because if you are working on your own energy at 20, 25, 30 years old, that means you have to be open in your mind. It's very interesting to see. For me, when I was 20, I used to, I was too young, but I, I wanted to travel at the same time. So I arranged at every, for every vacation, holidays to travel, working at the same time. But I think I will react, I will do it differently today, you know, with what's happening with climate change, but also in terms of in terms of exchange, of, of cultural exchange with different countries. I don't know if you agree with me, Ashoka. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But I, it's very worrying what you said when, when you mentioned that young people are afraid to travel. Um, and I think it's the same, for instance, there are many, many Sri Lankans in Europe at the moment who even given the opportunity to come, to come and to see their elderly parents or whatever, they're afraid to come. You know, and in fact, in many ways, it's safer here than it is uh, outside in terms of the disease or whatever. But it's, it's been one of those negative aspects that this sense of fear of travel has come in, which to me, I mean, I've spent all my life, almost all my life away and then come back at various points. And I came back at the age of 30 and then settled down here. Um, so, so, so for me, having, having traveled and, and been a traveler for much of my life from the age of eight. Um, incidentally, I was in Mogadishu just across from Eritrea. We used to travel through Asmara to London each time the Alitalia fl flight stopped in Asmara on its way to Rome. Um, so I, I remember it in its sort of different days in the 1960s. But, but to get back to this thing, um, I, I'm worried that, that, that this fear of travel will only exacerbate this, like, I mean, you made the other point that people are, of course, very proud to be within their own little atmosphere and working with their hands, and it, it gives you a sense of rootedness and solidity, which is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But the, the, the slight cloud on the horizon is this fear of the great big world outside. Uh, I don't know whether I'm more, uh, not sensitive is the wrong word, but more frightened of it because I live in an island and because um, I mean, when you take Sri Lanka, it, it's always been an entrepot for every every other race. We've had the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Roman coins, the Roman coins up and down the coast, the northwest coast. If you dig, you will find Roman coins and so on. So we've always been sort of we've always had visits from other civilizations. Um, but I kind of worry that by closing up these boundaries, we will not we will lose some of that that. Um, internationalism for want of a better word i don't know i maybe maybe i'm 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 being paranoid here so i hope history will prove me wrong but uh, but that that is my thing but, but tell me to change the subject entirely 
you what years were you in Sri Lanka? Olivier, what, the last, what, last travel I was reporter at this time, war reporter, it was, it, I think, 10 years ago, more than yeah, 15 years ago, yes. And 16. I used to travel in the north in the guerrilla, also areas, and in Colombo, too. Uh, I used to write uh, not, uh, not many articles, but some long, some long articles, you know, and especially on the on the incidents and the uh, on the war, actually. Yeah. So it was interesting to see. I try always when I was war reporter. So I quit uh, just when I was working at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it was I was nominated in 2008. So up to 2008, I was war reporter and I used for 20 years. I used to cover war, but not only. I have write also very on positive as aspect too and magazine story. But uh, coming back to the war reporting. Uh, my theory, my method was to try to go on both sides. When I was in Colombo, when I was in Sri Lanka, I wanted to see uh, uh, regular forces and uh, authorities in Colombo, and then to go, trying to go on the other side. Same for all the conflict I've, I, I, I've covered, like uh, Afghanistan, that used to know uh, the ambassador, Eric Lavertu, also Israel and Palestinian territories in Africa, uh, Syria, Syria recently for a book on Kurdistan, the Kurds, for the rebels fighting against uh, Daesh, Islamic State, but also in Iraq, uh, Syria, other part of Syria. So uh, yes, it's always interesting to see, to try to have an idea, not even if you're engaged, if you if you want to want to defend a cause, let's say, but I want, there's no neutrality actually when you're a journalist. I think like as a writer, for me, the best topic, the best method is to recognize subjectivity. We are, and all the viewers, or the organizer, we are subject. We are subject. We are involved in subjectivity. There is a very famous German Jewish philosopher called Walter Benjamin, who died in 1940 on the Spanish border. And in 1921, he used to write in a philosophical essay that objectivity does not exist. For me, it's true, even in terms of exact science, even in terms of medicine and physics. You know. For human science and history, you need not only to add data, dates and data, you need to have perspective with your own experience as an historian. So it could, all, could be a pluridisciplinary approach with a ethnological approach, economical approach, a law approach, an historical approach, also same for journalism. And I'm sure as a novelist, a writer, I shock uh, you will be uh, agree with me that uh, fiction is coming from reality and fiction can explain better sometimes than documents than universitarian phases. We have a um, famous philosopher in France who recently died, Michel Serre, saying that a novel could explain better the world than 100 phases from university, you know. I'm sure it's true because uh, in a novel, in a good novel actually, you. You are friends, uh, you read it differently if it's a good one at the age of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and so on. And uh, you are learning yourself. And coming back, actually, it's interesting to have this discussion, actually. Coming back to your fear, we can be afraid of that, the fear of travel. And uh, not only for medical reasons, it's because also globalization, the fear to have a cost, you know, climate cost, etc. But I think we, we have to continue to travel with better eyes. We, we, we don't need to discover all the world. We need to discover one culture, one neighbor, whatever country, and to go back. There is a famous also Swiss travel writer. And I don't know the title in English. Uh, I read it actually in Sri Lanka called Nicolas Bouvier. I'm sure the ambassador knows yes, that. Yes, the, uh, yeah, yeah, you know it. Yes. The, the, the title in French was Le Poisson Scorpion, or maybe Scorpion Fish. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, and it's, yeah. Nicolas Bouvier is like a master for us as you know, a travel writer. He says that when you are a travel writer, you need to travel six months for you and then to go back at home in a small house, in a small room in Switzerland or in UK, or in France or in Spain and to write for six months in a remote, isolated area or on an island. And it's, uh, it's very strange. And uh, I was just going back to the uh, free of travel and the imagination. I was on an island in, in Greece, finishing a book. And uh, it was a book actually on the Mediterranean Sea. It's a book, I have it here. This is my sister, sister house. I'm not in Paris, in Nice again. And it's uh, the title is in The Enlightenment of the World. It's about a famous painter from Venezia from the 15th century. 
and uh, called Bellini, and he used to go to see the Sultan of Osman Empire in Istanbul, yes. which had been saved to the Christian a few years before, mid middle of 15th century. And for me, it was the occasion to write about insularity, to speak about the change at this time, the favor of peace between Christianity and Islam, between uh, Venezia and the Western uh, powers at this time, Italy and France and uh, Osman Empire, and to speak about the exchange between the uh, free regions of the book, you know, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. It was very interesting, actually, to watch. And so I was on a small island in Greece, but maybe at two kilometers, at least, distances from Turkey, you know, which is out of a culture, out of a continent, out of a religion between Greece and, and Turkey. And it was very interesting to see that. Uh, I have other ideas about insularity, about the opening of the Mediterranean Sea, about the history, about the necessity to exchange. And, you know, also uh, the um, southern part of Europe, which is Spain, France, Italy, Greece, and the northern part of Africa, which is also another continent, another region, are separated by the sea, Mediterranean Sea. But it's not a border anymore. It's very easy to cross now. And it's very interesting to see how it's changing. Do we need to uh, integrate, to exchange with other countries, or will it create by fear populism? Even you know, a new regime, as you can see in the eastern part of Eastern Europe, with uh, far right parties winning the election. You know? So it's very interesting to see that, and it's uh, maybe because the borders of Europe are not. Uh, very fixed, you know, because it's open. The borders in Spain are very different from borders with Germany, you know, and borders with Greece different from border with UK, which is an island. And so Europe has to define again the spirit. I don't mean the. Uh, I want to say about the act of law of, of the of the of the of the border, but the spirit of Europe and the spirit of borders, you know, this is very, very interesting to see. And the same for uh, Sri Lanka, which is uh, at not remoted. It's an island, but also a very, as you mentioned, open, open state with history. Uh, going back to what you said a little bit earlier about um, writing, you cannot help it, but it is subjective. Um, and I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, is there such a thing as creative nonfiction? In other words, when you write nonfiction, which is essentially your war reportage or whatever, is it creative? I, you have to forgive me. I have not read anything of yours because being on an island, we're very isolated, and I, I hadn't come across your writing till 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 now, sort of thing. So, so just tell me: is it is it possible to have a nonfiction that is creative or written in a creative manner, in a subjective manner? Yeah, actually, there's a very interesting trend, new trend in literature coming from journalism called new journalism. It, actually, it was created with Tom Wolf and. Uh, uh, Thompson and other writers from uh, USA uh, coming from journalism. So um, they fuel subjectivity, they fuel personal impression. It was totally different from the journalism you, you, you know also from UK, because you're shocked. I know you used to live there with um, facts, only facts, you know, and you have to check. It's normal to, fact, to, to, to check the facts, double check, as we say in the American universities. But uh, when you have an idea of what is a story, and I think, I think it's coming, all what you are doing is coming from storytelling, which is older than alphabet, you know? So uh, subjectivity is coming from story storytelling also. And from a storytelling, you can fuel imagination, you can add fiction. I want also to come back to some writers, very famous like Hemingway, Dos Paso, Steinbeck, we got the Nobel Prize, I think just after Hemingway. Um, Vasily Grossman, which was a Soviet uh, Stalinian at the time, a writer who uh, became anti-Stalinian writer, uh, actually writing on Stalingrad, which is a famous, you know, uh, place of fighting between Soviet troops and Nazi German troops in 42, 1942. And all these writers are coming from war reporting. And at the time when you are a war reporter coming from the fact, let's say, the, from the reality, you say enough, enough is enough. We can't explain what's happening in the world, what we feel personally happening in the world. We only facts. We have to give perspective, extrapolation, deduction, you know, anticipation. 
And this is a place for the novel. And I think with, for example, three personages existing, you can create one, you know. And for me, it's not lying if, if it's a novel, you know. And the novel can explain better. Uh, for example, coming back for, with uh, Sri Lanka, I, I, I read also Michael Ondaatje with uh, Hanis Gold, you know. And Hanis Gold was one interesting book explaining also part of living, you know, in, in Sri Lanka. And I think, yes, uh, uh, creative uh, nonfiction is very interesting for this new trend of literature. And I'm sure you also, also Ashok, who are writing novels, I'm sure you are not coming from self-fiction. You are coming from reality, your experience. I'm sure I'm yeah, yeah. right. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Particularly my, my latest one, it's called The Unmanageable Man. And it's actually about a, a period of my life in London in, in the 1980s. And, and it was very, it was a difficult novel to write because quite often, I mean, as I've said in various interviews, I've, the, uh, the truth has to hold good as fiction and not the other way around. So, so it, it, you know, sometimes the truth is actually much stranger than fiction, in which case it doesn't work. You, you need truth that holds good as fiction. And, and that's what I've tried to do with that novel. But, but it, 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 it's on that borderline between fiction and nonfiction. So you can call it creative nonfiction or non-creative fiction, if you like. I, I don't know which, which, which mm -hmm. there's no such phrase, obviously, but you know what I mean. Um, so it's a very interesting thing. I, I, I think in my case, because I started writing very late in life, I was a builder long before that. I, before that, I was a mathematician. So it's kind of like the third or fourth career that I've had. Uh, it just shows you how bad I was at everything if I had to keep moving on, by the way. But anyway, having got to it at that late stage in my life, it also means that that you 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 are able to view it um, with more objectivity. You can see yourself as a writer struggling with, with whatever you want to write. But you also have this huge armory of life behind you stuff that you can use and sort of so writing becoming a fiction writer at the age of 42 is quite different from becoming a fiction writer at the age of 18 when essentially you have nothing to write about you have the, the desire and, and the absolute hunger to write but there is absolutely nothing for you to write about because you haven't lived as yet so so it, it's seeing seeing things from the other end of of, of life if you like so i'm that, sure that, you yeah I'm sure the experience we have lived in London, UK as a young Sri Lanka is very interesting also to see because uh, you are shared, maybe be divided between two cultures, even if you are, uh, I mean, uh, part of also British uh, history. Uh, but uh, yeah. so you're not a foreigner in London, what, what I want to mean. No, but, but always an outsider, yeah. always an outsider. Uh, outsider, correctly. I'm sure I will read your book also. I'm sure. Uh, you can bring to view to, to readers um, a new range of sensitivity because I'm sure there was sadness, there was nostalgia, there was different uh, torments of soul. And for me, what is the power of literature? I mean, fiction, you know? but even maybe uh, non-fiction, creative non-fiction, is to open the mind first to have hope and dreams, as I mentioned, which is very very important, especially for young people. I used to grow up with uh, books, you know, at the age of eight, nine, ten. And it opened my mind. You know, I wanted to travel and to write, or to write and to travel because of uh, my master Cervantes. I mentioned good, which was a, a German uh, writer too, uh, and so on. And even Jack London, even Hemingway. You know. And um, you are bringing, I'm sure, I shock your sensitivity to sensitivity to 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 readers because uh, I think the part of the work for the writers and to is to explain what we have in our earth. So it's coming to the particular, going to uh, universal. You know, it's not so obvious, but I, I think um, it, it, it has to come from the soul. It has to come from experience. So it's both, so it's kind of fiction. You know? I, I, I will not be able to describe really my soul and your soul. Even when you are a biographer, you know, it's not even in 1000 pages to explain the carry is a life of a writer or a philosopher, philosopher. You have some gaps, you know, you have some black holes. Even if you are a second, it's not possible to explain. So you have to invent, you have to be in the novel, you know. And, um, and this is a gap between two parts of true 
a physical tool, let's say, a tangible tool. And uh, this is the power of imagination and fiction and, uh, and literature. And uh, for me, the uh, real aspect of literature is not to bring exoticism. I mentioned uh, Hemingway, I mentioned Steinbeck, but you have also a very famous writer coming from Poland, but I actually wrote in English, Joseph Conrad. And come yes, out of yes. the heart of darkness, you know. Uh, use Who you have been compared to very often in your writing. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's marvelous. It's marvelous. Conrad used to, let's say, uh, to describe the uh, the frame, the mountain, the island, you know, in Indonesia, in Melanesia, and so on. But for which purpose? Only to discover the torments of soul, you know. And for me, the adventure is interesting only when there is humanity. It means principle, values, and human adventure. And human adventure is literature. Yeah. I'm sure you, you, you bring that also in your books, Ashok, I'm sure. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's um, I, 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 I suppose I, I like to think that I try and reflect the Sri Lankan psyche in these books. And it's very, very complex, Sri Lanka. Uh, you know, you, to get back to our original uh, uh, theory, you think tropical island, easy. Um, people come here, particularly uh, people on holiday who are here for one week, they think it's India light. Oh, it's like India, but much lighter. And we can we can do it in a week and we will have, boy, are they wrong. I always say that, that India, although it's a continent with 300 odd languages and religions and castes and this and that, yet they're much more similar and more homogenous or homogeneous than we Sri Lankans are. We are very, very, very divided in our, there are grades and grades and grades here. So it, it's quite it's quite a different, very complex society. Anyway, it's the, that's what I, I like to think. I try and tackle that in, in, in my writing. Whether I succeed or not, you, you, you would be a better judge than I would, but, but still one has to attempt it. One has to attempt it, yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. So we, we can, uh, yeah, you can work on that actually together <laughs> to work on fiction, the power of nonfiction also, and how it's the borders are very thin actually between the two fields. And uh, yes, yes, yes. Just tell me one question before I, I'm sure uh, Aurelia will want to open this up to the to to general question. But um, in, in L'Enchantement du Monde, uh, the, the book that you were talking about about Gentile Bellini, is that is that is that um, historical fiction? Because I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of curious to ask you, uh, is that book, uh, have you written it as a story or have you written it more, I mean, I, just describe it to me because I, I love that painting yeah. that you did. I think my uh, sister is a good Be Bellini painting of... Uh, yeah. Bring it to you. This is a cover, this is a cover, but actually yes. the real story is that in, uh, at the end of 15th century, so the Venetian 14th painter, century, yeah. the Venetia, the favor of peace with... Uh, let's say Osman Empire, used to go to uh, Istanbul, which was at this time Constantinople, so town yes. says by the yes. Turks uh, to the Christian. And um, the young emperor, the young Sultan Mehmet II was very clever Mehmet when he II. ties yeah. uh, Istanbul uh, on two continents on the Strait of Bophorus. He used to speak six languages, uh, you know, Arabic, oh, wow. Turkish, wow. Or Persian, yeah. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And he said, what I have to do now with my nomads, with my nomadic empire, but uh, because the, um, the Osman Empire will settle down on Istanbul, my new town, you know, and whose size Istanbul is seizing the world, as mentioned one surat of the Quran, the holy book of Islam. And so it was very clever. And it was totally haram, forbidden to draw, actually to paint to yeah. the image yeah. of a man and especially the Sultan. So he has the idea. So this is a real story, but of two lines. So, this is in a national gallery in UK, in you know, maybe London, I've seen, isn't I bring it? my son yes, to yes. that to see this yeah, painting. I, I love that painting. So this yeah. is the, actually the uh, Osman Emperor, Osman Sultan Mehmet II, wrote painted yeah. by Bellini. So Bellini. in my mind, so the story is true, but it's only two lines. So why he has the idea of this young and clever emperor to, 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 to cross the border actually, you know, of iconoclasm, I mean, we don't have, the, the, the right actually to, to, to paint a, a king or a, a, or a sultan. It's because he wanted to fight some fanaticism, etc. So for me, it was just an idea, it was a topic. So I used to read something of between 50 and 60 books, but uh, just to be easy actually on the price of, uh, of let's say bread at this time or of 
how, how far was it to, 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 to sail from Venezia to Istanbul, etc., etc. But after that, you cook. You put in the same plate, you know, and you cook. You can make space, you, you can fuel, you can add rice and, uh, and yeah. cheese, etc. Yeah. And you cook, you cook. And it's very interesting because what I, I will be, I will be enabled actually to teach what is a fiction in a workshop or in a university in France and USA. It's the same for journalism because I think the common method is alchemy. This is an alchemy. I'm sure for you also. What is the beginning of a book? I'm sure you have many plans, many notes for one of your novels. And after, <laughs> you, are not, you are not the master. Your heroes, my heroes are the master. They are leaving us, yes. you know. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you are leaving, you are sleeping with them for six months, one year, two years, three years. And this is for imagination. But that's kind of logic and logic also uh, coming from the soul, actually, of the personage. You know? Bring crossing border, crossing the border of history also, and so the uh, enlightenment of the world was this topic. So it was coming, starting actually from reality, two lines of reality, and, and this painting actually in London, and then yeah. going to uh, imagination to to speak of the modern world about fanaticism, yeah. about what's happening also in the in 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 the Islamic in the Muslim world also with Afghanistan and so on, Daesh, Islamic State. So for, for me, it was like a metaphor, you know, like. A, a parable, you know, an image of what's yeah. happening in the world. So what's happening? It's also, yeah. yes, yeah. it's also a question of uh, subjectivity. <laughs> but I'm sure it's the yeah. same for you, yeah. as yes. you know. Yes. You start also Wonderful. from. I, I look forward to reading that book because it, it has everything that I like: paintings and history, and and as you say, trying to understand the the the, the cross culture, the clash. It's not really a clash, but the change of culture from from yeah. the Venetian to the Ottoman and so on. Yeah. Um, Aurelia, are we ready for any questions or do we, yes. we chat a bit longer? What? Yes, of course. Um, so first to the audience, if, uh, if you want to ask some questions, you can write that down in the chat box. I just wanted to ask first a question regarding a different type of insularity that we haven't much mentioned yet. It's a continental insularity. And how do you believe that it can be felt in a different way or what are the characteristics of, uh, of continental insularity? Especially referring to uh, to your latest book, um, if you had a comment on it. <laughs> well, I mean, to me, as an islander, it is it's a complete puzzle, and and we briefly touched on it earlier on in our conversation. Why why is there this rise of insularity on the continent or even America, the the rise of the far right sort of thing? Uh, um, Again, again, very worrying. It's, it's insularity in all its wrong forms, it seems to me. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think, uh, Olivier? What is the reason for this? Yeah, I think um, insularity could be a coercitive, you know, compulsory insularity because of physical distance, because of, let's say, maritime borders, because of uh, of the um, forbidding to cross the border, to have a physical passport, etc. And then it could be also voluntary on also for a continent, for a country. But uh, I've seen that also in some countries, you are like in a jail. I mean, you know, dictatorships, etc. It's not possible to travel, it's not possible to take chain, even with new tools of communication, with internet, it's control. It's, um, it's a parallel because the, again, it's globalization is very often very easy actually to have access to uh, knowledge, to uh, to the books, to the culture, to foreign, let's say, culture, foreign exchange. At the same time, the borders are here, you know, it's uh, severely controlled, it could be banned, it could be, you know, repressed, uh, creating anxiety, you know, also in the uh, inside the population. So, uh, yeah, I think the, um, the tools is again the hope, you know, hope is very important and hope is bringing also by novel, by literature and by culture in general, you know, renewing civilization, you know, adding some uh, new aspect of exchange, you know, even informal, non-physical exchange, you know, you can travel at home. Uh, there was a famous uh, French writer called Demes in the 18th century who used to write 
a book travel in my room, you know, <laughs> around my room. It's uh, so uh, this is when it's voluntary, you know, uh, and when there's a coercive isolation, it's, it's more dangerous and because it's manipulation behind and uh, it's uh, physical and political coercion. And again, uh, literature and culture can bring hope, but also crossing the borders. Good, good way of expressing it. Yeah. yeah. If I may say something, um, first, first of all, thank you very much because uh, we are uh, enjoying a lot and uh, learning a lot. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Olivier and uh, and Ashok. Um, this concept of uh, continental uh, insularity. Uh, I think it's it's quite it's quite interesting because uh, and to to talk about uh, about uh, 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 Sri Lanka for example, um, you are from Kandy or you you have you have uh, roots in Kandy uh, Ashok, and Kandy during I mean uh, the the kingdom of Kandy was quite an island in the middle of an island. Uh, and because it was, oh, it's not exactly continental because, of course, uh, the island is, is is not so so big. But but uh, it's a quite interesting as it is. Uh, it was something isolated. It was uh, something different from the coast, and especially from the coast with uh, with the, the the colonial power, uh, Portuguese and Dutch. Than British, uh, so it's it's quite it's quite interesting to to see that and this concept. I of course uh, Olivier knows about uh, uh, Afghanistan. Of course, we can think about uh, this isolation and this uh, this uh, this way to be an island uh, in the land. So it's uh, it's quite it's quite an interesting concept, and I think. Um, it opens us to understand what is uh, what is the meaning for people who are isolated, isolated in a, in a continent, uh, but isolated. I, of course, I talk about uh, uh, about uh, Sri Lanka and uh, and Afghanistan, but that's the same thing in some part of uh, Ethiopia, for example. Uh, so, so I, I think we are we are touching something uh, very interesting and very uh, a concept that is a, a little a little bit uh, paradoxical from what we we think when we we talk about an island. And I, I'm very interested to to hear about your uh, your your thoughts about it. Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly in Sri Lanka, uh, I always joke, my wife has relations in Gaul, as you know, and whenever I call him and I say, how goes it in the deep south, you know, and of course, Gaul is not the deep south, but, but, but people in Kandy like to think of themselves as quite different from people in Gaul and who think themselves quite different from people in Jaffna and the, the dramatic law, every, so, so you're, you're absolutely right. We have loads and loads of little islands in the middle of this, this biggish island. Uh, and, and that insularity is there. And we kind of, we make a joke of it, but we are also quietly quite happy that each of these areas has their very own uh, particularity. But, but then of course, France is the perfect example of this because you have such different varieties of cuisine when you go from one area of France to another and so on. So I think Olivier, you, you probably agree that there are many, many nations inside France. Um, many, many different cultures, shall we say. Olivier? Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm agree. And uh, at the same time, we have uh, also nation building or maybe cultural building also with literature, with art. And when you have wars, when you have boundaries, when you have isolation, when you have insularity, again, there's a kind of reflex, you know, not to transgress, but to uh, open, open the mind, you know, to try to find a way of exchange. Again, a border is also there, not to fix the limit, but to exchange, you know. Uh, sometimes it could be totally hermetic, but uh, it's rare, you know. Uh, 
for the most common time, you know, the borders are open. And so even when it's remote areas, you know, there's a kind of exchange, you know, and respect from both part, both uh, sides of the borders. And uh, so uh, coming back to uh, isolation, you know, it could be coercive or voluntary, but it's bringing, it's fueling, you know, new trends of culture. So I'm, I want to speak yes, about, about that, about this topic of cultural building, you know, between the states also, between some entities, uh, could be also again in some remote areas, like in France, you know, what we have been called by sociologists, hyper rurality. It means, you know, very, very special remote areas in the mountains or poor areas with the, uh, the, 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 the level of, of life very, very, very low, etc. So uh, it's, it's, there's not only economic uh, aggregates or factors, there's also cultural one. You know? So it's very important to uh, to cross the borders, actually to open the mind. You know? This is coming from the from the individual, you know, and, and coming from individuals, coming with human principles, with values, and especially brought by uh, by novel. Not only it's also with two tools, education and culture. So culture is also family, you know. Education could be the state, and education is also coming from family. And for me, it's very important to, to add, to transmit actually human principles. So I, I'm here on how to transmit to my children, to others, because I receive a lot, you know, I receive a lot. And I remember when I was uh, shooting um, a documentary for Arte, which is a German French uh, TV channel. It was on the road to Ganja in India, you know, from the sources of Ganja down to Calcutta, which is not exactly on Ganja, but you know, going down in the Indo Gangetic. Uh, area with 400 million people, you know, around. So I, I stopped in Varanasi, and Varanasi was Benares. I used to meet a, a priest, a Brahmin, you know, from high caste, and he was also a professor at, uh, of biology in, in, in Varanasi University. And he received, let's say, the equivalent of Nobel Prize for ecology because he wanted to save the Ganja. But he said, in front of the camera, it was in live, you know, in direct. Everybody, everyone, every of us, receive from our gods, from the Christian God, from Muslim God, Allah, from the Jewish God, the God from, from Judaism, from the pantheon of uh, Hinduism, etc. receive a sparkle. And we need to use, we need to transmit also this sparkle like a fire to others. And it's it's always interesting when I I, I, I talk to that with young people in Kabul, in uh, South Africa, in ghettos, in townships, in South America, in Mexico, in Lima, in Peru, about that and say, yes, I have a sparkle. Yes, you have a sparkle. You can do it, you, John, and uh, Andreas, and uh, Juan, etc. And the young people are very aware of that. They are very uh, confident to say, OK, I have a sparkle. I have to do it. But this is a sparkle for others in sense of humanity. And I think again, culture, I mean, uh, literary culture, literature bringing, you know, some tools to link uh, uh, everyone, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's not naivety, it's a principle of humanity for me. Wonderful, wonderful. Very interesting. Uh, thank you for your answers. We have a question from uh, uh, one of the, uh, the invite, the invite list, who says a question to Olivier Weber in your lines of work you must see the best and worst of humanity does it leave you émerveillé or écœuré in French with our sometimes sad species <laughs> yes I understand the question it's about uh, I, am I disgusted or enlightened let's say by the world and uh, I'm always positive and if you see the cycle of violence for example because you are also speaking of violence of wars not only of borders of isolating the cultures the villages the people the tribes in terms of ethnology uh, the cycle of violence is improving you know for the last two centuries it's, it's strange maybe when you are looking let's say only in the Middle East you know the war maybe it's far away from Sri Lanka but Afghanistan is not far after you have war in Iraq, war in Libya, war in Syria, war in Yemen, which is not a country anymore, and so on. And maybe tomorrow over conflicts and uh, over threats. But the uh, cycle of violence is uh, improving, actually. And we have, I, I mean, those tools with special international law, with the international organization as the UN, United Nations, the ambassador knows very well also. And, uh, so there's some mean actually to fight the violence and uh, 
yeah, I, I will say that I am optimistic and I want to uh, share also the values and the principles. Um, just a, a pessimistic about uh, climate change, you know, because uh, humanity, I mean, human being forget to, to save the net where we are living, to save the village, you know, the frame. And the other species of uh, the, uh, the animals don't forget actually, but the human being forgets, that's, that's a pity. But uh, in terms also of uh, production of dream, of hope, of literature, of novels, like he's doing a shock also on us writers. I think it's very important to remain, to recall that, you know, that we need hope, dreams, <clears throat> and to bring back to reality for the next generation, not for us, of the others. You know. Well, on this very hopeful note, <laughs> uh, I think we can close down the discussion now so, uh, to end it on time. Uh, so thank you, thank you for to both thank of you. you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Real next time I, in, in yeah, Colombo. Even in Canada. I hope we will see you in Sri Lanka before long. I hope. <laughs> Thank you very much for both of you uh, and, and, of course, uh, uh, Aurelia. Uh, and um, uh, we are waiting for you, uh, Olivier. Uh, and you. We, we will be very pleased to, to, to have you in the next event and uh, 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 not on the internet. And I, I thank you. Uh, very much because you mentioned uh, Nicolas Bouvier and uh, uh, on the last Goal uh, Literature Fe Festival, we organized uh, uh, an exhibition uh, about uh, Nicolas Bouvier, about 200 meters from, from the place where he lived for, for um, six months and uh, he prepared and he, he wrote some part of, uh, of the Poisson Scorpion. Uh, so well, uh, I'm sure you will uh, you will come and you will you will see the place, and uh, and of course Ashok will explain everything about uh, uh, well what you find in uh, in uh, in Sri Lanka and especially especially ghosts and devils and and plenty of things uh, and you have to read uh, all his books. And uh, that's a, a very good introduction to to uh, to Sri Lanka. So that we you know of course uh, already. So thank you very much. Thank you Ashok. Thank you, thank you Olivier. Thank, thank you, you very thank much you, uh, Aurelia. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.